So I had previously given this talk at Central, but I covered only free NAS. So I've added for this talk, I've added the Rustic backup. So it's really two half-hour talks thrown together. Okay. Uh, so the reason why I wanted to talk about both of these. So in my office, I have a, I have a Linux laptop. And I need to back that up. And then I have I'm a VMware consultant, so I have a VMware cluster, and my VMware cluster is running on FreeNAS, and I really need to back up at least parts of FreeNAS. So it's really only two things I have to back up. But I will say, so we'll talk about Restic for Linux backup first, and then on, that, on FreeNAS, there's really two kinds of backup you have to be concerned about. There's static files, which back up very easily in the cloud, and then there's running, running active VMs which unfortunately don't back up to the cloud very well. So on my Linux laptop here, um, which is running Ubuntu, Deja 2 is a uh, graphical backup program, comes with Ubuntu. So if I'm setting up a laptop for some non-technical course and I just run that, works great if you're backing up to local hard disk. Uh, it doesn't really have any support for S3 or anything. The cloud. Um, I then switched on this laptop to, to Duplicity. So Duplicity is command line only, it has many targets. Um, so it does support S3, it does support encryption. Um, it looks pretty nice, but I basically decided not to run it because every time I try to do a backup to S3, it was just too slow. If I'm, especially if I'm backing up when I'm traveling on, on a public Wi-Fi or something, it was just too slow. So duplicity in the office when I have a LAN connection, backing up a little hard disk to an NFS mount, that worked great. So about the time I did the last talk, I was trying out Rustic. So this is a completely new backup system. It's been out probably about a year. Um, a lot of the same targets. It does encryption that's built in, and that doesn't need GPG. Um, it also does global dedupes. So you have multiple computers. It will dedupe across the whole pool of computers. Is that per repo on Rustic? I believe so, yes. Um, so, so you can, each repo is tagged with the host that's, got, that's <coughs> generating the backup, but it's storing individual encrypted parts of the files that are deduped. So if, they're, if it has the dedupe, up there already. Well, I, I just know you can do <coughs> rest it in it against the target, and that creates a repo. But if you do that more than once, does it dedupe across both of those? The same, the same repo? Well, no. If you if you initialize two different two repos different on repos. the same target, no. does it do dedupe across them? I wouldn't think so either, but it can be cool if it did. Because I'd, I'd probably like to have different repos for different things. But if you're doing a restore, if you have multiple things in the in the repo, especially if you have multiple computers that might want to do across them, you can specify I want the restore only from this computer. Right. So it does a lot of things are streaming. Yes. Have you heard of board backup? And yeah. have you tried that? I haven't tried it. I've heard of it. Um, so a lot of people comparing the two, but uh, so <laughs> I, I just started with this one. And it's working great. So, um, it, it does streaming operations, so duplicitly would grab a bunch of files, save them to the disk, and then read those files back and GPG encrypt them. So you're saving and reading and send back to your local <coughs> hard drive. Right? Uh, from what I can tell, Restic just reads the data and streams everything up to the target. What that means is a lot of the indexes that it's saving are saved at the end of the file rather than the beginning of the file, which is kind of strange. But. Does it do uh, Windows, like volume, shadow, copy, and all that stuff? We does have a Windows um, client, but I'm not sure if it has any support for shadow copies. Yeah, that's, that's one thing I've noticed, like, a lot of them, some of them, though, you kind of pick and, like, these end up using a Windows-specific solution, even if it's open source, because you really want that if you want to back up your registry. So, so the reason that I've pretty much switched, when I was using the Plicity, the only way it worked is to have, a, have an NFS mount, which means I had to be in my office. I had to mount the NFS drive, and then do the backup. If I was remote, I had to bring up the VPN connection, mount the NFS drive, then do the backup. So it was a diff different procedure depending on where I was. With Duplicity, it just works. Um, we'll, we'll 
token that um, and it seems to run very, very well over the public Wi-Fi. So some of the statistics. So I cleaned up my home door, but it's now down to about 200 gig. Um, the reason it was so huge, there was a whole bunch of ISO, VMware and, and Solaris, all ISOs for everything. I cleaned up a bunch of that. Um, the initial backup, from what I remember, took three hours over my FIOS connection, which is uh, like at least 50 gig for 50 megabits. Um, incremental backups, even over public Wi-Fi, are, are completing about three minutes plus the time for the transfer. So that's very, very acceptable. If I'm in a um, Starbucks or something, and just queue, queue a backup up, it works, yes. Well, like how much data are you talking about for that three minutes? Well, three minutes, if, if nothing changed, it takes about three minutes to do its handshaking, and then depending on what um, you've done. So encryption is very fast due to the encryption that they're using. Um, so the bottleneck is really the Wi-Fi. And it's it's has some, I think it's LZW compression. It's not as, as good compression as duplicity. But, um, but in the end, it's, it was faster. So the, the incremental stuff, is that block level or spot level, do you know? It's not block level. Is it? Ooh, that's awfully nice for VMware images. So I think this, this has clients for, you can run, run this on a server as well as a, it, it might be, it might be binary, I'm not sure, it might be binary transfers of each file. So it does, it does break things on a file level, if I rephrase that. But it's transmitting. We'll get into that a little bit about how it does the um, deduplication. Is it doing a lot of rsync like duplicity, or is it doing? It? So it has just like rsync has a method of chopping up the file into bits and doing um, deduplication. It has a similar algorithm. Um, except duplicity actually uses live rsync, which is why it can do the plot. Yeah. So it's not using live rsync. They use a separate algorithm. So I found on my laptop, 200 gig, that the S3 usage on that is about 150 gig when it's up there, and every time we do a um, backup, that expands by maybe a gig or something. If you have a lot of changes, it might expand up. So now, are you backing up to the S3, and then the S3 is pulling it down to your home system, or so for the laptop? Uh -huh. Just so that it's the same everywhere I go, I'm just backing up directly to S3. Right. So it doesn't matter now if I'm if I'm at home, I have a fast okay. if I'm here. In fact, we'll run it from here a little bit. It just works. Okay. Sorry, I didn't mean that. So the commands are very, very simple, rustic, the path of where you want to store the repository in a net. So the, the path can be an SFTP path. If you want to get to Amazon, you just export the keys. That's not the safest way to do it, but you export the keys and then rustic, and you pass the path to your bucket. So that, and this asks for passwords, so the password of this initialized repository is encrypted once you create it. And every time you get into that repository, you have to enter your password. Interesting. So just to show you how simple the commands are, resting backup, snapshots, so it shows you a list of all the snapshots that are up there. Check only checks the meta metadata. If there is an op command line option to go through and check all the data, which would obviously take forever. You can find and pass it a log card and find all the ISOs and we'll try that. Uh, the really interesting thing is it does it has a fuse mount option. Yes. So the, the data that's backed up, is it um, like hard or zipped or is it uh, one to one or so we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit. Okay, all right. On the previous slide, the uh, looked like you have a bunch of restic commands starting with the capital R. Um, that was just mine. That's the that's the um, LibreOffice I'm doing that. Oh, okay. <laughs> I just wanted to yeah. double check that it wasn't. No. Oh, well, you specify these no. things. Every time I you have to go back and fix it. It does capitalization. So it has a fuse mount option, so you can mount the entire GDU repository from S3, mount it locally, and then go through and explore. So that's very neat. So. If you're interested in storing S3, the problem with S3 is it's object storage. And all the POSIX, all the commands, in fact, rsync. Everyone loves rsync, right? rsync doesn't work because you can't do, um, 
you read modify writing on files or whatever, if you have a change in file, you have to upload the whole thing. So basically everything you love doesn't work on S3. So what Rustic, I mean, essentially if you read through it, it's a very complicated um, system, but if you read through what they're essentially doing is storing a bunch of files on S3 and they're basically, basically creating a file system. They're, they're setting up files that represent the directory of metadata. They're setting up other files that represent tiny blobs of the actual data. And those blobs are encrypted. And so, so you are, with, with all those tiny chunks of data up on S3, you're being able, able to recreate a file system on the fly locally. Now, it does cache a lot of the indexes that store what things you have in S3 are kept locally. Um, if I go back to um, 150 gig, I found on my laptop it had a cache of about 250 megabyte, megabytes out of 200 gig. So less, yeah. less than a percent. So basically, and, and it, if you lose that, will it resync? Like, will it fetch the indexes to? I mean, plus you'll do that. Plus you'll do that. Yeah. Um, there is an option to clear the cache, so I would assume that it, it would repopulate it. I haven't tried that. That would be interesting to try. It, it's amazing how circular this industry is. You're, you're giving that description of how it's using S3, and all I'm thinking is that's exactly how Microsoft Mail used to work. You know, 25, 30 years ago, it put files in a bucket and did things to them, but it was all client side. Yeah, so it's just amazing. Yeah. So S3 essentially is, is storing metadata on, on a local disk or S3, which is basically your, your directory information. Um, a, a tree list or a list of, of which binary objects are in this file. And then the actual blobs, which they try to they try to create blobs that they shove up to S3 in one megabit to eight megabit segments. So it's shipping each or it's streaming each blob up to Amazon as fast as it can. And the, the name of the blob is the SHA 256 sum of the contents. So the file names up on S3 are these big long shot at 256. So it's basically content addressable storage. You can go, you know, the checksum, you can go and find the log. They do have a two level, two level directory tree to keep number of files in any one directory down. So when you want to cut a file up into pieces to send it out there, the simplest way is to just chop it up in uniform chunks. The problem with that is, if you insert a byte at the beginning, everything shifts, and so the checksum of all the all the succeeding blocks would change, which would break your deduplication algorithm. Right? So you don't want to be sensitive to inserting a byte or removing a byte. So what they do, they essentially have a sliding 64-bit window, and they look at the data in this window and compute the checksum of that small window, and they slide it over a byte. Compute the new checksum. Slide over by compute the new checksum. Whenever the lower x number of bits is zero, something like um, the um, hash algorithm, or whatever the, the lower lower x number of bits is zero, they consider that a point where they want to cut the file. So they're using the contents of the file to decide when to cut it. That's clever. Marcy does the same thing, different algorithm. So this. The algorithm they're using is called Raven fingerprints. Now, when you're computing that 64 chunk of uh, uh, window, when you go to the next position, all you have to do is adjust the checksum for the addition of the next byte and removal of this byte. So you don't have to recompute it every time. You just compute, move the window, adjust for the, the leading and trailing uh, checksum. So what that does, the, these cut points occur every so often, and they. And they just have a rule saying we're not going to allow cut points to be less than 512, um, 512K. So you have a minimum chunk. And we're not going to allow the chunk to be like greater than 8 megabits. So if, you, if it were to grow, just because of the randomness of the data, if it were to grow up to 8 megabits, they're just going to chop it off. Unfortunately, that means that that block is fixed length. And if the bits change, it's subject to, to uh, shifting. I found on my system, with 200 gigs of data, it was averaging, the average chunk size was 4 megabits. So it's, it's averaging right in the middle of that window. 
Um, so Rustics and Golang. <laughs> So all these environment variables, you have to have the path to the repository and the AWS key and the secret and whatever, they're all in the environment. I tend to not want to leave them in my environment, so I'll show you a script that I'm using instead. But for right now, all the important variables are in a local environment. So you can just ask for the snapshots. So what I did is write a shell script of our backup, and basically it just, instead of putting all these secret variables in the local environment and allowing everybody to read them, um, I just source that file at the beginning of the shell script, and they're available for this command only. So basically this script is very simple, it just makes uh, much less typing. So I have, uh, let's try backup. So you can do a backup and a tag. So basically it has to see what has changed. It's scanned. There's 198 gigabits up in the repository. That must be the total number of files in the repository. And now it's analyzing what has changed. Is it doing SFFTP or CP or something like that? It's its own protocol. Well, I mean, but what are you backing up to? This is backing up to S3. Oh, it's okay. The reason I did this, I just dropped my VPN connection. So basically, S3 it looks like it communicates over port 80. So you don't need anything special. It's all encrypted. You don't need a VPN. You don't need. So usually this takes two or three minutes just to do its analysis of what has changed. It probably has to scan and look for um, yeah, changes. Old right. Now you could cron this out, obviously. Um, yes. Yeah, so I have it on a cron job, so at 9 p.m. every night. And so it doesn't matter whether I'm traveling or local, just 9 p.m., as long as I leave the computer on, it does the backup. Nice. That's what they tell you. If you don't have it automated, you're going to forget. Yeah. yeah. So. Are you using cron or anacron? Right now I'm using cron at 9 p.m. I'd love to, for whatever reason, I couldn't get anacron to run. I mean, I probably just don't know anacron now. So there, it, it just did the backup, and you can see the tag was applied. You can do things like, uh, you can do a diff. Yeah, Anacron doesn't exist on, B on any of the BSDs, so that's the Linux thing. So if you do a okay. diff, diff between two snapshots. Well, well it just <laughs> Anacron has the benefit of if the computer's well, off yeah. during its normal window, it tries to yeah. do it. Right. But that's only on Linux. Possible. That's only on Linux. Right. Yeah. So. So again, due to a slow cache, a lot of these operations seem to work pretty fast. There's, there's my presentation. Um, so 
The other option that might be interesting is the mount. So mount, uh, and I have a local directory called MT. Say mount first. For some reason my terminal doesn't want to open another terminal, but in home directory there should be a mount. Oh, to the left. No. Over one. The right. Yeah. So hosts, panda, and these are the snapshots similar to the latest home directory. So there's your whole dedupe repository for this host, and you can have multiple hosts up there. What file systems is it limited to? Limited, limited to? If you um, get an SSHFS or... You what targets? Yeah, like... Um, yeah, I mean, it, and or. So I think uh, we might go up to the... the I know it does... Um, Blaze, Blaze, Blaze Backup right. does S3. They just incorporated support for our clone. So anything that our clone supports. So you can on the command line say back up to our clone and then pass the our clone commanders, commands on this command line. <coughs> so they keep, they're, they're plugins, so they just kind of keep adding. That's cool. Um, so I have the our backup script. It's just a simple bash script. Uh, I'd love to have, uh, you can you can check it for security. So basically, I'm sourcing a file with all the secrets and commands and just, just running things. And um, let's see here. So rest, .rest config is a, is a file with all the secrets in it. And it basically, it's just a simple. I'm not a batch expert, so I'm just keeping keeping it simple and just collecting parameters and sending the parameters to Rusty. Uh, so this will be available on the, in the notes as well. So that was Rustic, so I'm very happy with how it's backing up my um, my backup, my laptop. So the second part, so for FreeNAS, I do have instructions on how I built this FreeNAS hardware. Um, this is a 2950, has six Three and a half inch drives has two SSDs in the, in the CD-ROM slot. Nice. And it has a has a flash in the front. Yeah, that's been moved inside, and a flash in the back. A rear if you operating system. Now I noticed that in your uh, NFS display of your storage, you had four, uh, a couple four terabyte drives. Yes, I started out with two. Uh -huh. Two terabytes are sold. They're starting to die. Okay. So I'm replacing them as needed you. with four. And so I've replaced two in the two in a mirror with four terabytes, and then you you would expect that the size would increase. It didn't. Right. It turns out that there were formatting issues on the disk drive. The, the format, <laughs> which, which goes back to the the Solaris format command. And so I actually have a whole um, how to on how I fix that. You have to go and run and re-expand the. Uh, the, the disk drive. How loud is your 2950? I have two of them. This one's quiet. The other one that's running ESX, I usually shut off because it's so loud. Like, I don't know why. And I have a Dell 7 R710 and it's quiet. Interesting. But, yeah, I get rid of my, when, when I, my, I have 2950 to my mid-TV server. When I shut that thing off, the, the noise wasn't a problem. I get chilly in my office now, which is in my basement. I never used to when I was <laughs> <laughs> so literally heated in my office. So, so I have I have at least five terabytes or maybe up to ten terabytes on here. So my myth TV, no, my, not my myth, my Plex, does dump all the TV shows to here. You yes. also find you no longer need to wear your protection. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have. <coughs> I, 
it's quiet enough. Uh, and it was in, like, I have a little enclosed thing with a, a louver door because I knew it was going to get hot. So it's floor and two walls are, are concrete, you know, pour concrete underground. I was hoping that'd be enough of a heat sink. And without that, it is. Yeah, I exhaust, <laughs> I exhaust this whole rack to a storage area to keep the hot air out of my house. So. Yeah, so that's, that's, I mean, every time I read, like, people are like, oh, yeah, you can get these used servers, this, that, and it's like, it's like, yeah, what's the power consumption on that thing? Because I, I just, that's a lot. That's, that's kind of why, like, when I don't play with Seth or whatever, it's like, can you get this thing working on Raspberry Pi yeah. or whatever? Because, you know, I, I, like, I don't mind paying for the spinning disks, but, like, when the server's got, like, dual Xeons in it that are just, yeah. like, you know, shorts to the AC yeah. power, you know? Yeah. The 710s and 720s are a lot better. So, right? you you have, put them on my question? Yeah, my question was, uh, you can, like, run, like, in the jails, like, pretty much your any VMs. Yeah, the, the jails support they're adding to the new version of FreeNAS. Turns out that this CPU is too old to run jails. So, like, so, pretty much anything for Intel 4th generation. You need Intel BTD and you need uh, EP, EP, I think you need EPT or something. Um, it's, Instead of pay support, but whatever, I have some, but not all the flags, so they won't do, won't want to run anything there. Okay. So that would be interesting. So you could do storage if you have very few computers, and you could run some BSD. I think they support Linux uh, running in a GF as well. So like I could run this plus like Pyroll and like a bunch of other stuff on the same server. Well, so it depends. So if you're running, like you probably wouldn't run run Plex. Is something requiring a lot of CPU on the same box of your storage. I mean, that defeats right. the ZFS needs a lot of CPU and a lot of RAM. Yeah. So yeah. if you really need performance, I keep all that stuff off. Isn't it? A, isn't it a, a couple gigs of RAM per terabyte? There's a recommendation of something. If you're if you're doing dedupe, it's something like. Uh, oh, <laughs> now, so it, it also depends. CSS level. If if you're mirroring, you need less CPU and RAM than, in, than right. if you're doing RAID Z2 or RAID Z3. Freenas is an, an appliance, yeah. so it's, you're not running yeah, you don't want to be doing it's stuff on an appliance. Okay. No, it's a software appliance. Well, it's no, no, no Freenas is a free BSD distribution edge. If, you're, if but, you're starting yeah. out and, you're, and you're, you're, your budget, you start out and you run some things here, but the plan should be as you grow and you run more and more things that, that this be dedicated to, to storage you to, and you run yeah. on the server for something else. You just do NFS from all the pies. So, yeah. so on my... On my page here at plumbing.forever.com, there's a whole bunch of talks. One of them is a generic talk about ZFS and open storage that I gave in 2011. Another is a complete how-to on building this exact box. When I built it, I was running um, SmartOS, SmartOS, from Joint. So all the instructions reference SmartOS, and I reference reformatting the SSD and a whole bunch of things you probably don't need to do, so you might have to ignore some of it. Um, but I then took that box without any hardware modifications, installed, installed FreeNAS on it, and it's been working great. So, FreeNAS. There's two options they have to support backups. There's a cloud sync option and the traditional ZFS send. So CloudSync, I think it is built on top of our clone, or works like our clone. So if you're going to S3 or something, again, you can't modify the file and the destination. If something changes, you have to upload the whole file in there. So if you have, if you're using CloudSync, you have a bunch of small files, you have a bunch of large files, but they're immutable, they're like ISO files or things that never change. You push them up once, they never change, and the CloudSync works great. But if you're running virtual machines that are changing all over the place, the thing is if one single bit changes and you're going up to S3, if you have that virtual disk, one bit changes, now you have to upload the whole virtual disk. So basically on a production volume, you'd have to be uploading the entire production volume every night. So it just doesn't work. So we'll first talk about the cloud sync. Um, how to set it up, it backs up, or it has support inside of FreeNAS for S3, Azure, GCP, just about everything. And so there are, it looks like they are using our clone. 
it's sim that which is similar to running rsync delete. So if you delete a file on the source, it's deleted on the destination. But if you change a file on the source, it uploads the whole thing. Now, our clone, if you are going to traditional storage on hard disk, you probably can upgrade, up upload just the changed bits like rsync. The problem is S3 doesn't support that. So that's, that's the problem. If you want to go to S3, a lot of this stuff doesn't work. So when you're setting up the cloud sync inside of FreeNAS, you need a credential. You're pushing or pulling. You specify the bucket. Specify the um, the one that you're backing up and how often. So this is the part where people get into trouble. So according to Amazon, you should create a policy that gives permission only to that bucket. Don't create a policy that gives access to your whole Amazon route. So if someone steals this credential, someone breaks in the free NAS, this, this is only giving resources to this one bucket. It turns out it's a little bit more complicated. Let me switch over here to the um, GUI. So in the tasks menu on FreeNAS, there's the cloud sync option. So you can see here I'm pushing that F software is basically a collection of ISOs and, and um, files that never change. Mm -hmm. I'm pushing it up. It turns out if you if you run that, let's see here. You say run now. It's running. Time later, it's it just, yeah, nothing. Nothing has changed in that directory. So I just run this every day. But if I were to do this on my production volume, <coughs> let's let's switch here to um. This is the storage view. So these are the these are the volumes on my FreeNAS. So I have software and just ISOs and things like that. Here's for virtual machine templates. Development or VMs that I'm using development that I don't really care to back up. Production are things that I do care, VMs that I do care to back up. So basically I want to sync this file. And production is pretty big, it's 600 gigabits. So what I was saying, the reason this policy is, is complex is because when you're in FreeNAS, when you're creating the sync, you have to pick a credential. This is an Amazon credential, so let's pick the cloud sync credential. It then goes up and grabs a list of all your buckets. So it has to have the permission to list all the buckets. Even though the permission doesn't let you write to any of these buckets, there's one, one part of this permission that says here that you can list all the buckets for just for anything. And then you have another set of permissions that only for this one bucket and this one path you can write or read. And so I know a little bit, just a little bit about Amazon IM security. It still took me a couple hours, especially because FreeNAS doesn't tell you that you need these permissions. There's, there's no help anywhere to tell you exactly. There's, there's help for um, 
for our, for, not for our sake, for our, our clone and things on how to set it up. But there's no help for freeness. So the second option, if you want to back up a, a volume that has virtual machines on it, they're changing all the time. And that's the ZFS replication. So this, as you were saying earlier, this is binary differential replication. So and send receive? ZFS send receive, but it's sending a binary copy up. So it doesn't really matter. If you have files that have certain permissions, everything is preserved because it's just sending the, bit, the binary bits up. The other nice thing is it doesn't have to traverse the file system to find out what has changed because ZFS keeps track of birth times and files or change times. So it just looks at the directory and knows what's new. It doesn't, doesn't have to do all the scanning. Kind of crappy script that does this for a while. In FreeNAS, as you mentioned, and we're asking about quiescent, FreeNAS has the ability to talk to vCenter and ask vCenter to quiesce. So that's built in, which is pretty amazing for an open source solution. So they do that, and then vCenter will ask the VM to quiesce. So if it's Windows, it'll do a, a shadow copy. <coughs> so if you want to do this replication, you can't do it to S3 because S3 doesn't support what you need. But it turns out that our, excuse me, our sync.net had changed all their infrastructure to run on ZFS. So now that they're running on ZFS, they're providing you, for no cost, they're providing you ZFS snapshots. But as an experimental uh, project, they're giving a couple people free VSD VMs. As long as you rent a terabyte of storage from them, they'll give you a free VM here. Because the basic account doesn't have the, doesn't have the permissions to do things, but you actually get root access in this VM, and then you can do ZFS syncs directly. So it turns out the GUI can be configured directly from the GUI to replicate to rsync.net. You've got to you, uh, specify the remote volume folder. A couple options have to be, like they only support one type of compression. <clears throat> and this is like the um, The remote host key, so you're make, making sure you don't connect to the wrong host. It copies it down from that. But let's take a look here. Uh, so if I, yeah, the other thing you could probably do, or I see people do, is you can, I mean, you could just, you know, to send files, and you just save those themselves. You just pipe it to a, a file. Because it's, 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 it's so, one way only. You know, they so. tell you not to do that because if anything goes wrong and there's a corruption in the file, you don't know it. That's true. If you're sending to another ZFS, the instant there's corruption in the stream, it tells you. And you also have to make sure you save every single one, whereas with receive, you could potentially start purging earlier. Because it presumably does an increment on the last snapshot. So if I SSH to FreeNAS, so I have a key set up, obviously. So if I do a ZFS list, I get all my volumes. If I do a ZFS list, type snap. Rep, prod. So my production volume here has snapshots going back like a week or something. So basically, every time, every time it creates a snapshot, it replicates the, the differential between between these two snapshots. It takes that differential and sends it up to the target at RC. And RC knows it's a differential. So RC, RC, or the destination has to have these same snapshots, snapshots, because you're building on top of the previous. So if I change this and log into SSH into Z RSync, so this is my this is my virtual machine at RSync. Same thing, ZFS list. Now, for, because they're running inside a VM or something, for some reason these directories appear double. I don't know what why they have to stack them that way. That's the way it shows up. But you get the same list of. I just get my crappy script to do that too. <laughs> ZFS 
list type map. And so basically the same list of snapshots up on the remote target. Now, if you have to recover, FreeNAS doesn't have a GUI option to recover, so you're going to have to do a ZFS send, and you probably want to do it from your local machine. So I actually probably should document this. It took me, the first time I wanted to try it out, it took me days of searching on the internet to write, write commands to basically have to SSH to remote and tell it to start a ZFS send to a process that's already running locally as a, a ZFS receive. Couldn't you just pipe it? Because the way I do my crappy scripts, it pipes it to an SSH ZFS receive. Of course, you need to give that remote box access, shell access to your local box to do it. Right. Well, there's a way to do it the reverse process where you're going out from your, from your local box, going out and telling it to, to send back. And that way you don't have to give permission to the untrusted box. You don't have to give a lot of permission for that. But, yeah. So, probably or something. So, I think as, as far as option goes, if you want to do a ZFS replication, either you have to have it your own ZFS box somewhere. It doesn't have to be the same version of, of the, the file system has to be the same version, but the operating system doesn't. Um, else you can replicate if you want. Our sync is not that expensive. I think it's a little bit more expensive than S3. A terabyte of, terabyte of storage in our sync on that costs $60 a month. What's, what's S3 cost? I got 30. For reduced redundancy. So, this, but this would not be unusable because of all the replication involved on production volume. And here, here it just works. You pay a little bit more money. Yeah. Um, so there are links. If you do a Google for RSync and ZFS, you'll see their offer to hobbyists or whatever to try out this service. So I don't know, they, their, their main site doesn't really offer this ZFS service. So I actually notice it's only four cents per gigabyte per month. That's forty bucks a month. Okay. R sync. And and S3 is about three, I think, for reduced redundancy. At the check the latest price. So if you go to my other website, there's a how to 10 terabyte ZFS storage on Dell 2950. So there's that picture. So it, ZFS is very unhappy with a RAID controller. Oh, so. yeah. Yeah, 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 really? yeah because, it's, because it is a volume right. manager. Right. So they tell you don't use it. If you, if you have a disk fail and you have a rate controller in between, you'll be very unhappy because ZFS doesn't know that it's failed. And yeah. So I basically took the, the Dell Perk 6i rate controller in the old 2950 and found a Dell SAS 6IR. And I think I, since then I've changed it yet again. Um, so for, for a dumb controller. <clears throat> but can't you just take the perk and just tell it don't do it, just make them jiggle? It's not like you got to flash them or something. Like that. Some some cards have have some options yeah. that if you fl if you flash them and it gives you that option. If not, they're RAID they're, they're RAID zero or RAID one discs on a single disc, which isn't good enough. Mm -hmm. So some of the cheap ones just don't have the option for JPO. <clears throat> so for the SSDs. If you're using SSD for cache, there's no real, real um, requirements. But if you're using SSD for your, for your write log, you want to make sure that the SSD has capacitors in here to keep this up. So if you lose power, you want to be able to write. If there was writes in transit going into here, you want to be able to finish the writes. And there's only a couple. The Intel 320s and the Intel. 3700s that I'm using now, whatever, there's only a couple SSDs that have this. So they're really enterprise SSDs, but because this is only like 80 gigabits, these are cheap. You can probably get these less than 100 bucks. And for the, the write cache, 
you only have to, st basically you're storing all the writes for the last four seconds or something. They're being stored in here and then that's all being flushed out to the main pool of business. So you're only s saving a very limited amount of writes in here. So it doesn't have to be large. So how big are those? They're, they're 80, 80 gigs? These, I had two 80 gig drives in there originally. I took one of them and replaced it with a higher quality Intel 3700, which is like 100 gig, but it has more endurance. The right. problem is you're writing every four seconds, right. you're writing it here. So eventually you're going to burn this thing out. These are, these are considered throwaway. When you, when you burn this out, I don't think you're losing your data, but your system slows down at like 1%. So it's just for writing cache or? or? It's for write, synchronous writes. Okay. So okay. if you're doing random writes, it never uses this. If you're doing synchronous okay. writes, no, the, main, the main data that you're writing goes in the RAM. Right. It's kept there. In case you have a power failure, the data that's coming in to be written is also written to SFP. Gotcha. OK. All right. If you lose power, you lose the, the copy and RAM. When you power the device up, it takes the data in here and flushes it back out to the disk. Right. So this actually is never read. It normally puts the data in RAM and pulls it out of RAM during the flush into the pool. So you said it writes to it every four seconds? It's a, it's a tunable parameter. Gotcha. But so depending on the amount of gigabytes, the turning up on your network bandwidth coming in the box, if you have a one gig link, you're not going to be able to fill this up and you need much less cash. If you have a 10 gig link, sure. you have more data coming in, so you might need a larger. Yeah, sure, gotcha. Are they mirrored uh, or striped? Or? So mine's not mirrored, which okay. means if I lose this, you're in trouble? No, so if I lose this, the data's still in RAM, right. it's going to just flush it out of RAM. So only if I, only during the time when it's flushing, if I have a power failure at the same time. Okay. That's, that's okay. true, that's, I didn't think about that. Right. So there's a very narrow window where you might, go, might lose something. I think they might have even solved that. Um, I've, got, I've got my souls near, but that might also, they don't, you don't so, need much space for it. So the other thing is you can probably throw an L2 mark on the same drive too. Right. So if you're in production in a, in a company, you usually mirror them because you don't want to lose the performance when you lose a so You want the thing to keep running, warning, warn you that you have a problem. Now they, the high end, they used to have devices that were RAM that had a parallel, a parallel flash device hooked to RAM which means you're reading and writing from this device, which is RAM, which is even faster. And if you have a power failure, it would, in parallel, copy all the RAM to flash. And it would do that in the five seconds that you had to do to these capacitors. Right. Yes? So you should get SSD with capacitors, essentially. There's a, you just read up on, online with ZFS and using what devices are appropriate for the ZIL. That's the CFS intent log. And I think it, it just should have, should have some power loss protection. Again, it's not expensive. You can buy these devices for. But if you just copy data to the NAS and then delete it off the local, like you can make sure the copy's there and then make sure you don't really need these, like this cache device. So if, if you don't have this cache, the intent log is written to the pool, which is okay. just slower. So the only only problem is if you're doing synchronous writes. So if, if you're if you're in a virtual environment, NFS does synchronous writes. Meaning it, Windows, say Windows a box has a write. The Windows goes to VMware. VMware does the write. And it doesn't acknowledge the write until the storage system says I have it. And the storage system won't say I have it until it's flushed out to the pool. To flush it out to the pool of all those disks, it has to wait for four. It's very inefficient to write one byte. You have to write a whole stripe in ZFS. So you have to write, wait for all this data for four seconds, then flush it all out, and then you can acknowledge it. Right. So your NFS performance goes to zero. <laughs> if you're just, now, iSCSI apparently doesn't preserve the, the, um, the synchronous flag. So iSCSI will be happy and say, OK, I've got it, even though it hasn't. And it just works. If you have a power failure and you're not doing synchronous writes, you have you have the chance of scrambling your whole disk because if you're writing the directory entries and you lose power and that scramble, you're. I do not know that about ISCSI. That's horrible. 
and it depends. It depends on the, the operating system, VMware, everything's involved in passing that flag, the synchronous flag on. So VMware is very careful. VMware may preserve the flag on, on iSCSI, uh, but it depends on what you're hooking. Oh, JP, I looked up, I Googled the term. It's, it's IT mode or initiator target mode for the fancy read cards. Right. Is the mode you want them in, which just makes it look like a bunch of SAS or you know SAS interfaces or whatever. Actually, so you can buy one. They're for fifteen bucks. There's hub. They're essentially hub controllers for that is plugged into PCI. So I did switch to another card and had to do that, and I think I may have an article up somewhere on on that where I had to flash the card for IT mode. Yeah. Well, like somebody gave me a gave me one. Well, told me one. Yeah, you, you, you can, it depends what you want. If you want something, like if you want to be able to get like eight drives on it or something, you're going to want something with maybe SAS on it or whatever. And you want at least like a, you know, PCIe 4X or something so that, you know, you're not dumping all through one little lane. The, the other problem I found is normally the, okay, this, is the this is the front of the unit. Normally the rate card is up at the front of the unit. And when I bought the, the, the better generation rate card, I plugged it in. The slot at the front of the unit didn't work. Oh, it, 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 it threw up an error. Even though it sort of worked, it threw up an error, error to the um, system log. And something didn't work. When I relocated the card back to the normal slot in the back, it worked fine. So, Dell does all these funny, even back on the 2050, they're doing these funky things for licensing or whatever. If you don't start a Dell card. I've, I've heard that sort of stuff with some of the server hardware is they do all kinds of funky stuff with it. So right, so, so now I mounted my new credit card in the back here and then had to run um, longer SCSI cables up to the front. Um, so that that's the problem. That's why if you're, it, it's better off just buying something. If you're home and you can deal with Spending time and figuring this out, but if you're a company, it just plays. Well, if you're a company, you can, but, but they know if you want to have eight or 16, you know, SATA ports on the thing, they're going to charge you a pretty penny for it. Also, kind of what I was interested in doing with the set for the fact that you just have lots of cheap systems versus you don't need to not necessarily an LSI card or something like that. So, but two or four drives in the box and networking. Yeah, yeah, then you've got box maintenance and heat electric and all that. That's what I want to do with pies. <laughs> so, um, just, uh, just, just we never, uh, you just said, uh, I was looking at the Restic stuff today because I'd heard of it before, and there is a Restic article of a guy who's hooking up Restic with a Pi and a four terabyte drive. Just, yeah, that's. <clears throat> so, I'd be interested if anyone does it on a server or something. So, the, here the files aren't really locked. Um, if you're scripting, obviously go to database, you can flush the database out to a file before. So I never really showed the, the sync. So here we're looking at volumes. Um, you have to have a periodic snapshot set up for any volume you want to replicate. So here's snapshots that are taken once a day. And then you have replication tests. So here, for, for the production volume, I'm syncing to my remote arson directory and it does it once a day. And basically, when I when I see them run, they typically run and finish in five minutes. Or if if you look at the change, oh, that's what we can do. Look at the change rate. Um, so you can see. Out of essentially 500 gig of data, the, the daily change rate is averaging about two, maybe two gig. So that's what, half a percent. So that's that's how. It, and, it, and this is multiple VMs. The VM is my PSN firewall. I have web servers. I have all sorts of stuff running. 
and a couple of gigabytes a day transfer. Now, are you running ZFS deduplication on your ZFS page? No. From but what I understand, it's not great to do that. I just wanted to know if that affected so these numbers. So or not. if you have the minimum, it's something like eight gigabytes. Eight, giga, 8 megabytes of RAM per gigabyte of disk or something. My server only has 32 gig, and I have about 10 terabits, so I'm not sure I have enough RAM to satisfy those requirements. And most people say it's just uh, more hassle than it's worth. But, but it does have very good um, compression. So, and obviously, I'm also running mirrors instead of running RAID Z2 or RAID D3, so I'm not losing a lot of disk space, but mirrors use less CPU. Mirrors are much more performant than, than higher levels of RAID. They're a hell of a lot easier to recover, too. So if you look um, back, so we can look at storage. We view the actual disks. There they are. If you want to view the RAID array, you have, to, you have to tap here and then here. And you can see that here's the pool. There's a mirror of two disks, a mirror of two disks, a mirror of two disks, and then there's a cache. There's all of these scroll rooms. Once a week? Yeah. And so then the basically. 12, 24 hours to scrub, I mean, it's slow. <laughs> mine, mine scrubs in like three or four hours. Really? And I'm doing the pool, which means all of the, that's the data of all my volumes. Well, you run it on BSD. Does BSD scrub in parallel? Because it's only so, that I did notice on Linux is it only scrubs like one mirror pair at a time. So it won't no, like I scrub, I'm, I'm scrubbing on this, I'm scrubbing the pool. In fact, let's look, look at scrubs. It looks like I have four, ter four terabytes in use. And you look at scrubs. Well, I mean, you issue the command on the pool, but if you actually look at it like on a top, you'll see two of the drives are like pegged at 100%, and all the other ones are idle. Whereas like with ButterFS, if you do that, you'll see all the drives at 100%, right. and it'll break in for but, but remember, I'm running on two, two CPUs, and these are quad core CPUs, and I have 32 gig of RAM. So this is. It's, it's, it's this bound in my case. Now, every so often, I'm get, I have very old disks, and the disks have been failing. And, and let's see if I can show that. Um, so if we go back to String for the error that, that uh, yeah, you just they're error processing live. Cam status, SCSI, yeah. SCSI sense recovered error, SCSI sense, I think, is the string that I search on. So SCSI. We are uh, at the time. Yeah, so, sorry. So if you look through the logs, apparently if you get a whole lot of errors here, the system will flag a red light saying, hey, you've got a disk going bad. And so here is SCSI error. So DA3 is throwing errors, and then DA0 throws an error. So what's happening is this is the disk finding an error, taking itself offline, and repairing itself with the internal controller, and then going back online. And, and, and during that time, that disk is offline. So the problem you can get into is a lot of your cheap disks, if they notice an error, they'll try to they'll try to read the data and remap it somewhere. But they might be offline for a minute. Yeah. The problem is if it's offline for more than a couple seconds, ZFS is going to throw that disk as, as bad. Even though it's not bad, it's just recovering. So 
I believe that the drives, there's my backup one. Uh, so what they recommend is these drives for, for FreeNAS have a special flag saying, okay, if you're gonna if you're gonna do your own error correction, don't go offline for more than five seconds or something. There's some, I don't know the details, but there's some flag in there saying don't do that. Because you'd rather ZFS recover the error from going to the other mirror than worry about the disk fixing the problem. So what I'm saying is if you use cheap drives here, you can have drives that are perfectly normal if that they're flagging errors and they and you lose your whole pool because two of the drives happen to go offline to fix their errors. And if two of the drives in the same mirror go offline, now you lose your whole pool. So those are the edge cases that you can run into. So if you're having production data on here, you really have to study all the different uh, failure conditions that you have. So I'm, I'm monitoring this. So the next drive that I replace with a 4 terabyte drive is probably going to be DA3 before even before it's even flagged as, as permanently bad. I'm going to go in and replace it. So, all right. Any other questions? When you put the, this particular ZFS implementation, when you replace all of the drives with larger drives, does it automatically increase your pool? So as you replace two drives in a mirror, yeah. and if you have the auto expand property on the pool turned on, it's supposed to automatically increase that mirror. Now it turns out it didn't happen, so I exported the whole pool and then re-imported the pool, which is an option you can do at boot time. And that didn't fix it either. Uh, I think I had the same thing happen to me every day. And so somewhere on my web on my website here. I guess I'm going to go into your website. Mm -hmm. CFS mirror expansion doesn't see larger disk. So there is Jeep. Chief Martin was report, reporting a corrupted, apparently the partition table stores two copies in the front of the disk and the end of the disk for safety. And because this drive is larger, the second GPT uh, copy wasn't at the physical end of the disk, it was at the two terabyte end, not the four terabyte end. So it was flagged as the incorrect partition type, therefore it wasn't a valid mirror, because if it wasn't a valid mirror, it wouldn't let it expand. So there's an option, which this explains, to go in there, you can take that GPT, take the good copy at the front of the disk, and put it put a second good copy at the end of the disk where it belongs. Then the mirror is flagged as good, and then the space expands. So that that That's was about have, yeah, that was a solid day, and it was scary because I'm not a, a um, Solaris expert, so I'm going through here and relying on things on the internet. Um, but once I fixed the partition and then redid the, the information that I had written before, I just started working with this. So that, so one of my mirrors is now four terabytes in the other mirror. <coughs> so I now go to the next mirror and, and slowly increase it. But just go to, um, there's all sorts of good ZFS information here on, on I, don't, I don't have a formal blog, I just throw a bunch of papers up here on the site. So. All right, all right. Thank you. So that was uh, Bud West. Uh, thank you, Lee, for coming. We do go to the office afterwards. I won't be going. I have to go home and help my wife take care of babies. Uh, if you'd like to go, please uh, raise your hand so I can at least get an idea of uh, who's going, so I can tell who's going to be there first uh, to, you know, make room. So, you want to raise your hands really fast? Anybody else? Is it just you four? Okay. 